Good morning, Rock of Roseville. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today, sharing God's Word. I know that we've all been going through troubling times during the pandemic, and we also know, and Sally and I have been very much praying for you as a congregation as you go through the particular challenges that you're facing right now. I want you to know that we stand with you, that we love you, that we long to be with you, and we're grateful to have this opportunity of sharing with you today. God bless you as you continue to follow Jesus and walk with him into the mission that he has for you. And that's what we're going to, of course, talk about today. I know because I've known you for a long time now, I know that God has been working into you as a congregation what it means for you to live in the identity that God has given you. You know that you are the children of the living God. You know that you're the children of your heavenly Father. You know that Jesus is, of course, Lord and Savior, but he's also your brother, your co-heirs with Christ. Well, today, I want to take that knowledge that you have, that revelation that you've received, that you are the children of God, perhaps another step further, and ask you this simple question. Do you know your personal gospel? It seems a strange question to ask from one believer to another. Surely the gospel is the same for everyone. Well, of course, it is. Jesus died for all of us, and his death and resurrection, his saving work on the cross, is equally effective for each of us. There is one gospel, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. But for each one of us, there is a testimony that we bear. There is a, there is a testimony that we bear and a testimony that we can share, which is our unique window onto the single gospel. The gospel is the same for everyone, but we have a perspective on that gospel that gives us access to all of it that is from our own unique experience with God. Paul, when he was talking to the church in Rome, spoke about his personal gospel. When he's writing to Timothy towards the end of his life, he talks about his gospel. He's not differentiating between his gospel and everybody else's gospel. He's simply saying that the gospel that we all share is a gospel that we can see from the perspective of God's dealing in our life. And that brings a unique witness to the gospel, a unique testimony to bear that will add to all of the many voices that join together that become this great roaring torrent of the waterfall, the, the roaring river of the many voices of the people of God. This, this message that you personally bear is something that, of course, emerges from your identity as a child of God. And alongside that, your unique experience of meeting God and walking with him. Paul that we've just mentioned, of course, had a unique experience with the Lord Jesus on his way to Damascus. He meets Jesus on the way. He's knocked to the ground from his horse. He's blinded and he hears a voice and sees a flashing light. That unique experience and the particular things that Jesus says to Paul on his way to Damascus really are the content of his personal perspective on the one gospel of Jesus Christ. So today, I'm going to just work with you a little bit from the scriptures and help you think through what that might mean for you. Now, I know you're working through First uh, Peter, and we're going to get to First Peter chapter 2, I promise you. But I want to get there via the narrative that leads us to that point. And so we're going to go back in our Bibles and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 16 
and verse 13, a very familiar passage, a passage I think that I've probably shared with you when we've looked at covenant and kingdom together. Let's look at it and see what it is that the Lord would say to us about this particular understanding of our personal gospel. It says in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, the, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. So here is Jesus with his disciples working with them on what it is that he wants them to understand about his identity. But, but as they engage with his identity, he reveals to them their identity. He asks all of the disciples, who do the people say I am? And you, you know the interchange and the discourse that, that takes place there. And then up steps Peter, often the one who's boldest and first to the battle line, as it were. And there he, there he shares his own perspective. He's already, right at the very beginning of the journey, heard from his brother Andrew that Jesus is the Messiah. We know from John chapter 1 that Andrew spent the day with Jesus. And really before their call to be disciples, Andrew has engaged with this idea that, that Jesus may be the Messiah. And so he, he takes Jesus to meet his brother. And there Jesus begins to give Peter this unsettling word that, that there's a fresh identity that's waiting for him. Many months later, after Peter and Andrew, James and John and the other 12, and then the, the great crowd of disciples that are following Jesus through Galilee, as all of that has unfolded, Jesus has come towards the end of his mission to the Galilean area. And he takes his disciples on a retreat. And at the end of the retreat, as so often happens when we take a retreat with God, revelation occurs. It's been an enforced retreat, has it not, this coronavirus pandemic. We've been sequestered in our homes. We've been in lockdown. We have known what it is to be in retreat, but not necessarily willingly in that place. This unexpected enforced retreat has, for many of us, however, had the same kind of effect that every retreat has. Because, of course, as we've walked with the Lord, he's encouraged us to take advantage of every opportunity, and the opportunity for retreat brings revelation. I wonder what the revelation has been for you. Be sure to mark it down, write it down, as the prophet says, Though the revelation tarry, it will surely come. So mark it down in your journals and be sure to look back on what it is that God has said to you during this time. For Jesus and the disciples, they're at the end of their retreat and revelation is about to be born into the heart of Simon Peter. He says, not only are you the Messiah that was revealed to me when Andrew first introduced you to me. But now I believe that you're not only the Christ, the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. Something that, that to the average 
religious Jew at the time of Jesus would sound tantamount to blasphemy. Here is the Son of the living God. And Jesus says unequivocally, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, or Simon, son of John, this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood. This has been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And you are, and everybody knows the name Peter, but of course the Greek word is Petros. And perhaps there is a suggestion in the Greek that this is the diminutive. You are a small rock, a little rock. Everybody in Arkansas uh, loves this particular passage. You are little rock, and on this Petra, this big rock, I will build my church. Of course, Jesus is revealing to Peter that their identities are shared. The, the only person in the Bible that's known as the rock in the Old Testament is the Lord. And Jesus has claimed that title, has claimed that image for himself at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when he says, if you are a wise man who hears my words and puts them into practice, you build your house on a rock. Jesus is the rock. And so Jesus is extending his identity to, to Peter by saying that you're now Petros. I'm Petra. You're Petros, and we share the same identity, and we're connected to the same Heavenly Father. We're brothers. We're children of the same Heavenly Father. He is the one who cares for us, protects us, and provides for us. Of course, later on in the conversation, Jesus then goes on to speak about a rock that will cause Peter to stumble if he doesn't hold on to the truth that he's actually received. Now, this is a great day for Simon Peter. He has his name changed. Everybody knows that this is his name from now on. This is a great day because it's a day when Jesus affirms his capacity to hear the Father speaking to him. This is a great day because Jesus has revealed the way in which he will build his community of faith. This is a great day because it appears as though Jesus has identified Peter for special identity and treatment. Now, some Christians down through the centuries have suggested uh, for that reason that Peter has a preeminent position within all of the disciples of God. But, but that's not something that Peter believed, and we'll look at that in a moment. But this, this moment in Peter's life had a profound effect on him. When Peter, after the day of Pentecost, is leading the disciple band, Peter is clearly the person that people are looking to for guidance and leadership within Jerusalem as the church is blossoming and burgeoning. He and John, his, his missionary worker, partner, he and John are going to the temple to pray. There they will teach the people. They'll heal the sick. They'll cast out demons. They'll do all the work that Jesus used to do. And we know that on occasions, people will be waiting for the sun in the evening to, to cast a shadow from Peter, and they'll be healed by that shadow. Amazing things will be happening. But on their way to the temple on one particular occasion, there's a man by the beautiful gate who's been crippled the whole of his life. They probably passed him who knows how many times, hundreds perhaps. But on this occasion, something stirs within Peter. And as the old, the old kind of humorous English preacher once said, the man the beggar asked for arms, and God gave him legs. Here he is asking for silver 
or gold. And, and, and Peter says, we, we have neither of these. We have neither silver nor gold. Incidentally, uh, there was an occasion when Thomas Aquinas, one of the great teachers of the, of the Middle Ages, was walking the, the steps towards the great basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. And he had one of his young disciples with him. And one of the young disciples, who obviously was ardent and passionate, just like many of you, said to the angelic doctor, as Thomas Aquinas was known, he said, looking at the magnificence of the building, he said, Peter can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. And quick as a flash, Thomas Aquinas said, and sadly, neither can he say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Peter said, look, I have none of the things that you ask of me, but what I do have, I can give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up. The man came leaping and, and praising God as the old children's song tells us. And Peter and John are taken into prison and held captive overnight because of the commotion that's created. And the next day, they're brought before the Sanhedrin. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It has been several months since Peter has heard about his identity in Christ. He's shared in the identity of Jesus. Jesus has said, I'm the rock, you're the little rock. We share in the same identity. We have access to the same Father, which means that we have access to the same resources. We have access to the same power. These things have been working in Peter's heart. He's been through the devastation of his own denial. The, the reinstatement after the resurrection. He's been there at Pentecost. He's preached on the day of Pentecost and he's seen the crowds come in. And all the while, this, this moment of identity has worked into his heart so that it becomes his personal gospel, his personal perspective on the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. And he knows that the identity that Jesus has given him is an identity that means he stands in the authority of Jesus. Jesus has called him the little rock. That means that he's a chip off the old block. That means that he shares the same, the same connection to the Father that Jesus does. Amazing thoughts. But it means this, that when Peter is confronted by the faith in the man who's asking for money, that he is able to say, in the name, in the identity of Jesus, which of course, for Peter, he understood he shared in. And so Peter knows, and no doubt John now understands, certainly his writings would indicate that, that we find in the New Testament. They know that as they stand before this man, and God is moving in them by his Spirit, that the authority that is needed to proclaim healing over this man is an authority they have because of the identity that God has given them. And so the man walks. But all the while, 
that same message of identity. I've been called the rock by the rock. What can I share with the elders of the people? Well, what I can share is the same message. A message drawn from the Old Testament that speaks about leadership. Psalm 118, one of the references here that speaks about the cornerstone or the capstone. It's the same word uh, that's used or the same kind of word picture that's used in Hebrew and Greek. In the Old Testament, that, that idea of the cornerstone referred to the leaders of the people. And so if I'm going to speak to the leaders of the people, I'm going to speak about the leader of all of the leaders of the people. The true capstone that has been rejected just as the prophets foretold. These are the things that have been going around in Peter's heart and mind. And this is his personal message. He has a gospel to share. But he shares the gospel from the perspective of his own testimony. And when he's in that nip and tuck place of needing to find something to say on, a, on an occasion of great gravitas, he goes back to his personal gospel and shares a word with the leaders. The stone you builders rejected has become the capstone. These passages drawn from the Old Testament uh, portions of Scripture that, um, that indicate to us who the Messiah is and what it is that we're expecting him to do and the, the role that he, will, that he will take in our lives. Psalms 118, Isaiah, Zechariah, all of these all of these Old Testament prophecies have become something that are alive in the heart of Peter. So now, as we look through his life and we know something of his journey, we know something of the narrative, we don't know maybe as much as we know of, say, Paul. But we know that by the time he gets to the end of his life, he is wanting to share a word with the believers all around the world who have been dispersed around the world through the impetus of the Holy Spirit and through the persecution of the Roman Empire. And when we get to that place, we find, we find that my iPad won't work, is what we find. Let me see if I can get this started for us again. <laughs> It stopped. Um, we find Peter speaking to his people, the people for whom he feels responsible, and saying the very same things that he said before. I think I'm going to have to restart my iPad to make sure that I can get this particular passage to you today. Second Peter, uh, forgive me, First Peter chapter 2, and um, we'll just read it together. This is, this is Peter coming towards the end of his life, speaking to the people for whom he feels responsible. And he wants to make sure that the most important things that he carries in his heart and life are being, are being delivered to the people for whom he's responsible. He wants to make sure that the legacy he leaves is a legacy of his testimony of following Jesus. He says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God. So perhaps he's remembering that sermon before the elders and the leaders, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him. Verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
It's not just Peter who shares in the identity of Jesus the rock, Jesus the living stone. Peter says, you come to the living stone and you like living stones. You come to the living stone and you like living stones are being built together. By whom? By Jesus, of course, because Jesus said he will build his church on this rock of the revelation of who he is. Peter is not unique in sharing in the identity of Jesus. Peter is not unique in sharing in the sonship that, that Jesus offers to all of the children of God. All of us are equal before the Father because all of us, from the perspective of the Father, have received the identity of Jesus through the blood of the covenant. The covenant that makes us one with Jesus. And because we're one with Jesus, we're one with his identity. And because we're one with his identity, we share in his destiny, which is to walk with him and the Father for eternity. Identity gives us our destiny, and our destiny is something that we will embrace for all eternity. The Father is saying to you today that you are a living stone because Jesus is a living stone. Peter then goes on to reflect on those passages from the Old Testament that we referred to briefly. Verse 6, he goes on, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Peter, at the end of his life, is sharing his personal gospel with the people with whom he wants to share a legacy. What a great example Peter is to us. His word to us today is as fresh as it was the first day that this letter was delivered. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive the revelation that is contained there. But it's also an example to us of how we can progress in our life. Ask the Lord, what is it that he said to you when you first believed? What were the unique circumstances of your of your time of salvation. It may be a period of salvation. When, when you came to know the Lord, it may not be a single event that you can point to, but, but perhaps a phase, a, a period of time when, when the Lord was working in you. What was he saying to you? What was the revelation that he was sharing with you? What were the things that he said to you soon after you bowed the knee to Jesus? And how are they manifest in your life? Here's the thing I've noticed. When we grasp our identity, it changes the way we walk as believers. But when we grasp our personal gospel, it changes the way we bear testimony to the life that God has given us. We come with greater confidence. We come with greater certitude. We come with greater authority because it comes out of our experience. We share it as a testimony of our faith. And that personal gospel, that testimony of our life that gives us access to the whole gospel that tells us of the incarnation, it, that tells us of the ministry and mission that tells us of the crucifixion. 
that tells us of the resurrection, ascension, and future return. That gospel that we have a unique insight into because of our walk with God becomes not only a testimony to, to the world, but something that is fearsome to the devil. In Revelation 12, 11, John, who is hearing from Jesus, tells us that we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. This testimony, this unique message that you carry, this personal gospel terrifies the powers of darkness and testifies to the light of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you would settle in our heart our identity as the children of God. Settle in our heart that we share in the identity of Jesus. It's amazing for us to even consider it, Lord, but you say that we're co-heirs with Christ. And so, Lord, by faith we receive that truth. And we ask you, Lord, that the unique ways in which you have worked in us would begin to come out of us. Lord, we pray that the, the, the word that you've spoken to us would cause confidence to rise in us so that we can share our personal gospel, our testimony of faith. And we pray, Lord, that the powers of darkness would shake. And we pray, Lord, that the hearts of those around us would be turned to you, Lord Jesus. And you would, Lord, work through us a cause of great celebration in heaven. Because you say, Lord, that if one sinner should return to you, then it's a great day of celebration in heaven. Lord, may we be used in this way for your glory and for your purposes. Amen. Well, bless you guys. We do hope that we'll be able to get to see you when we can all travel and reconnect again. But we look forward to hearing great news of all the great things that God is doing through you as he's reviving that area. Bless you, and we'll see you soon.